evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you all, and uh, congratulations with uh, uh, filling the room so well. And I'm, I feel sorry for you guys who have been standing for so long. Um, and I realise that I am uh, the gap between you and the bar and a break. But I, <laughs> I'm very much hoping uh, that you will find this presentation as interesting as uh, some of the earlier ones, which I certainly found very interesting. Um, what we're going to be talking about is cancer, uh, how cancer develops, and how we believe that our company, Angle PLC, is going to make a difference to the entire world in terms of how cancer is diagnosed and treated in the future. And the reason I say that is because the um, uh, way that cancer progresses and spreads is via the blood system. So the cancer might start as breast cancer or prostate cancer or lung cancer, but ultimately, if it's going to progress, it will spread into other organs. So, for example, breast cancer will spread... Uh, to the bones and the brain and the lungs and the liver as common metastatic sites. The way it gets there is via the blood circulation system. So uh, it starts as, I'm giving examples on breast, but this is exactly the same for all solid tumours. It starts in the breast and then um, the breast cancer will drop cancer cells into the bloodstream and they will circulate, where they're known as circulating tumour cells. If they land somewhere else, they can start growing. So they're seeds of metastasis. And when they grow, that's when uh, the prognosis becomes very poor. And in fact, well over 90% of people who die from cancer die from this metastatic spread of the disease. So if you could learn about how that was happening, then you might be able to start to reduce it. In fact, it, I find it extremely shocking uh, that when patients are treated for cancer, the doctors do a tissue biopsy, which is absolutely standard of care, uh, to find out what's happening with the cancer, and that guides their treatment decisions, but the cancer changes over time. And later in the cancer uh, treatment, when the cancer's progressing and it's even more important to know what's happening, they have no new information, and therefore the decisions are more or less guesses uh, towards the end. We want to change that by enabling repeat biopsies, by sampling the blood, where there are these very uh, important <coughs> cancer cells that are spreading the disease, recovering them so that they can be analysed. So that means you can have a repeat biopsy, and repeat biopsy can then mean that patients can get treatments which are better for them, and we can reduce a lot of money that is wasted on drugs. So another, another statistics for you, immunotherapy drugs, which are the latest bastion of new drugs, cost roughly £150,000 per patient, per patient, but they only work for one in five patients. So think how much money is wasted and, and what a high proportion of patients don't get a benefit from drugs when they desperately need it. That's what we're trying to address with our parsortic system. Um, we've actually um, made a lot of progress um, over the last few years, such that we have something called an FDA product clearance. So this is the American government's regulatory system, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, and we're the only company in the world that has an FDA product clearance for recovering cancer cells from blood uh, for subsequent analysis. Um, and that, uh, that has now been followed recently uh, by the expansion of our product sales activities and the establishment of uh, a variety of distributors to uh, drive sales for the company. Uh, it's also been uh, followed at the beginning of this year, uh, first week of January, we announced uh, some very important data on DNA mutational analysis, um, uh, which we'll, I'll explain a little bit later um, in the presentation. So, uh, we've got a lot of momentum behind the company. Um, we've also announced uh, in the first week of January the first large, um, large, large um, pharmaceutical company that we signed as a customer, and I'll talk about uh, why that's important. But we're building out uh, many different areas uh, for, for the business uh, right now, so we're in the commercial phase. And what I'm expecting in 2024 is an expansion um, of our sales activity um, to give us a greater um, level of performance, wider use in pharma clinical trials, and also um, we're targeting getting clinical tests being offered from the Angle Laboratory for treating patients um, by the end of this year. In addition, uh, we're generating clinical data in prostate cancer and ovarian cancer. So there's lots of different things happening in Angle uh, in a very large uh, market uh, that we're operating in. So just to, um, to, to emphasize about the FDA product clearance, um, this is um, driven by a machine and a consumable. Uh, so that's the Parsorsix instrument. That's uh, 
quite a small um, bit of kit that sits on top of a um, uh, laptop bench, not taking up much space, about the same size as an inkjet printer. It's very easy to use. So in our labs, um, a single uh, technician can actually run 20 machines at the same time because it's plug and play. You just attach the blood and, uh, and then it runs. Um, and it's all driven by a one-time use um, pass audits cassette, uh, which is essentially um, the razor blade of our model. So um, the customer, every time they want to process a blood sample, they need uh, one of these uh, pass audits cassettes. And that's what's been FGA cleared. Now, um, the key part of this uh, whole thing is getting the best possible sample to benefit the patient. So what we're recovering from the blood, despite it being in very rare numbers, so maybe one cancer cell in a thousand million blood cells or taken another way in a tube of blood of 10 millilitres uh, there might be 10 cancer cells one cancer cell two cancer cells or several hundred cancer cells but they're very rare in number overall but if you can get those ca cancer cells you've got a sample which is a living cancer cell for which you can do all sorts of analysis you can do dna RNA, uh, you can do morphological analysis under a microscope, you can look at proteins, all the things that doctors would like to know uh, to guide their treatment decisions. So we're now in the commercial phase and there are lots of different things happening. Uh, so we've secured Esai, a major Japanese pharmaceutical company as a, as a big customer for us. They have £4 billion pounds in revenue and we're an important programme with them. We've got other similar contract discussions in progress and I'm hopeful we'll be able to sign some other very large um, household named pharma companies fairly soon. We're building product revenue, so we're selling this instrument and we're selling the consumables and uh, to drive that we've actually got a new product kit to make it easier for our customers to use, which I'll describe. Um, we announced uh, at the beginning of the year very, very good molecular results with the Illumina platform. The Illumina are the leading next generation sequencing platform um, company in the United States. Uh, we're also working with other platforms, including Thermo Fisher, who are the leaders in the rest of the world. And so we're hopeful we're going to get some good uh, data coming out from that as well. Uh, in the meantime, we have um, undertaken some ovarian and prostate cancer studies uh, where we have processed samples with our parsortic system, and these samples are waiting to be analysed uh, with an appropriate molecular platform, which is currently under evaluation at the moment. So later this year, we're hopeful we're going to get some uh, results on the detection and assessment of ovarian and prostate cancers. Um, and in the meantime, um, we're working towards getting the Angle Clinical Labs, which are based on the Surrey Research Park uh, near Guildford, so about 40 miles from here, uh, accredited both in the UK and Europe and in the United States, so that we'll be able to do uh, patient samples, which would be a very big step uh, forward for us. Um, so this lady, uh, Dr. Julie Lang, who's head of uh, breast surgery at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States, which is one of the US leading cancer centers, she did some fantastic work, which did a, an RNA uh, gene expression comparison of cancer cells from Parsortic's blood test with cancer cells from metastatic um, breast cancer patients' um, tissue biopsies. And she found basically similar information. Uh, it's in the guidelines in the United States that uh, breast cancer patients should have a tissue biopsy of their secondary cancer site. So if it's spread to the liver, they have some of their liver cut out. This is notwithstanding the fact that they're extremely sick. And in fact, over half the patients are, are not able to have a successful biopsy. So these patients get nothing. Even the ones who do get a biopsy only have one additional biopsy. When in reality, you'd like to have a blood test every three months or every month to test exactly what's happened uh, with the cancer. So I'll be quite quick about this, but the way that the system works is blood flows inside the parsortics cassette. The channel's closed at the end, so it has to go left or right. And what that does is it takes it up a series of steps. This is all patented. Um, and the cancer cell won't go through the critical gap, whereas the um, red and white blood cells and the plasma liquid will flow through. So by doing that, we've separated the cancer cells. And we've solved a problem which uh, scientists have been trying to solve for 50 years um, and yet uh, not been able to. Um, so I, I think I've said enough about the actual instrument. It's very easy to use. Now, this is um, a... Uh, animation of what's happening inside our parsortics cassette. So the blood flows in the inlet, it flows down the channel. Uh, you can see the channel is um, closed at the other end. It then goes up the staircase and the blood, the blood cells flow away over the top. The cancer cells are held at the critical gap. 
Um, and what this does is it very neatly extracts the cancer cells from, from the blood, um, giving you access to the best sample for downstream analysis. Now, this is a really interesting video, uh, which is of an actual breast cancer patient's uh, blood flowing in our cassette. So we've got billions of blood cells coming in here, red and white blood cells. That's the staircase looking down on top of it, those lines. So going up the staircase, and then the light color is a single cell deep of blood cells flowing through uh, the critical gut. And here, uh, these are the blood cells flowing away down the outlet channel, so they will go to waste. And in a minute, in amongst all these billions of cells, you will see uh, a cancer cell, and that is a captured cancer cell. That's all, probably also one there as well. So um, it's, it flows without any blockage. It's very easy. There's no damage to the cell. There's no chemical intervention. And actually, 99% of these cancer cells come out alive, uh, exactly in the form that they were in, in the patient. In fact, we've optimized the pressures and flow rates in the parsodic system to make sure that these cells are not damaged. And consequently, we not only get a very good recovery of the cancer cells, but we can also recover clusters of cancer cells, which have been shown to be um, very highly metastatic. Uh, so what I'm showing here is um, our efforts to sell this product. Uh, so obviously we're a small UK company. Um, we want to be much larger, of course, um, but we're a relatively small company. We've got about 130 staff, uh, most of whom are in the UK. We've got some, some in the US. But we need much more power to our arm in selling this. So we've been signing up distributors around the world. Um, and we've so far trained uh, 75 salespeople from these distributors. They're very well incentivized because they keep 30% of all revenues. Uh, so uh, they can do very well by selling this. These people have really only just got their feet under the desk. So we're expecting to see this, uh, this year um, quite a strong increase in um, product sales. We're anticipating, um, we've said, at least a 3x increase on last year, uh, on 2023. Um, we don't just have a product business, uh, we also have a services business. The, the idea of our services business is to provide an, uh, a demonstration of what can be done with Parsortics and also to accelerate the commercialization and, and the revenue. So our clinical people can take blood samples uh, from pharma companies and then they, they can process them and say what cancer cells can we find in the patient's blood, also what do those cancer cells express. Um, and this is uh, a, a, an opportunity that the pharma people can't do. Uh, we can do repeat testing of a patient in a trial. So before they go into the trial, we do a baseline. Um, and then during uh, the time that they're in the trial, we look to see if it's reduced the position. And then afterwards, uh, we, we, um, we can monitor that. So that gives multiple time points for patients. Whereas at the moment, uh, cancer drug trials are all about having two groups, um, one group that have the drug, another group that have a placebo, and then looking to see the survival rates of these two groups. So you might have to wait several years sometimes to get the results of those trials, whereas we can immediately um, uh, assess that by looking at what's happening in the, uh, in the patient blood. Um, we've been successful with securing an, um, about uh, five companies uh, as customers at the moment. These are an example of three of them. The most recent one, ESI, four billion in revenues, we're in one particular drug trial that they're uh, interested in. We're just doing a, a, initially a pilot. That's worth $250,000 to us. It's only 50 patients with two time points, so we're making $2,500 per blood tube that we process, and it only costs us a couple of hundred dollars to do that. Um, the reason they're doing that is because they have something called an antibody drug conjugate, uh, which is it's basically a way of delivering cancer drugs direct to the cancer cells to avoid toxicity. So um, uh, this drug conjugate will target HER2 expressing cancer cells and attach to them and then release the drug. So that, that is uh, it's, um, a brilliant new way of reducing the toxicities that one gets from chemotherapy, which is more of a general, uh, general drug, by targeting it. But the targeting only works if the cancer cells express the protein HER2. So for ESI, we've developed um, a special way of looking at the cancer cells that come out of parsortics and saying, do they express HER2? And if so, to what extent? Uh, so this big company with uh, 4 billion in revenues, uh, we're doing a pilot for them. Once that's done, we hope to get into a phase two trial, which will be worth a couple of million dollars to us, and then a phase three trial, which may be worth maybe $5 million to us, all from one particular line. They've got 80 oncology trials. This is just one aspect that I'm talking about. So this customer could be a very large customer for us. 
Um, and indeed, uh, they would like to have a companion diagnostic, ultimately, to determine which patients will respond to their drug and which won't. If they want that, uh, then they can work with Angle to get an extension of our FDA clearance to cover this specific application, which is why we did the FDA clearance in the first place, it's to enable this sort of thing. Um, and then there's a potential tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue for Angle uh, as, a, as a routine companion diagnostic for this drug, which would be a multi-billion dollar drug. Um, so think about the risk profile of this. Uh, obviously, developing a new drug, it may or may not get to market, but we're being paid and making money the whole way through the process. So if it stops, we get paid for everything that we've done and we can go on to the next trial. Obviously, we hope that it won't, won't stop. This other one, this next one, Artios, is a very successful private company in uh, Cambridge. I think they've had several hundreds of millions of investment as a private company. They're working on a particular pathway in cancer called DNA damage re response, and they paid Angle in our assay <coughs> development um, business to develop the ability to look at two proteins for them, gamma H2AX and PCAT1. The, the names are not really relevant, but the fact is we've earned £250,000 to develop this assay. Now they're putting it into their phase two <coughs> trial. Um, and not only that, we own the assay. So I was at a summit uh, in Boston last week, which is a DDR summit, and was able to talk to lots of other pharma companies to say, we've got this assay, do you guys want to use it? And uh, there was a lot of interest in that. Um, I'll jump over Crescendo, but that's a very good company as well. Um, we've developed a new product uh, to go with Parsortix, which is called Portrait Plus Antibody Staining Kit. And this helps our customer base to actually do uh, immunofluorescence staining of the cancer cells for their identification. So by buying this kit, which we've optimised, they can follow our instructions and they can stain the cells and then they can work out that they're cancer cells, what type of cancer cells, etc., and look at them under their own microscopes. Until we did this, it was a bit of a hit and miss because the customers would make up their own homebrew, if you like. Uh, so now we're standardising it, making it reproducible, much easier for our customers to adopt the past system because we're making the whole process of what you do with it uh, easier. Uh, we're working on a HER2 kit uh, which is just like I described with the antibody staining kit but adding in HER2 protein evaluation which is critical for breast cancer. So there are breast cancer drugs that target HER2 and actually 38% of patients HER2 status will change over time and doctors don't know how it's changed. So when this kit comes out we're expecting that clinical labs all over the world will want to use that. Um, we're doing that in collaboration with another company, and hence we're making money while we do the development. So we've been paid 1.2 million sterling, um, and we've been paid about half of that so far, the rest of it to come through on the <laughs> development. So we get to have an asset at the end of it, but we make money during the process. Right, okay, now I'm going to talk about the DNA information uh, which has just come out. Um, this is, I think, a game changer. Um, so... When we talk about DNA, we're talking about mutations, and cancer mutates over time, and now there are increasing numbers of targeted therapies that go for specific DNA mutations. So there's a really important need to find out what are the DNA mutations of that cancer at a particular uh, point in time. The whole world knows this, and there's been probably hundreds of billions, definitely tens of billions of dollars invested in trying to work out what is the patient's current DNA status because it's known that it will have changed from when they first um, were diagnosed. It changes over time. So what's happened? Um, how do they do that now? Well, they're analysing something called ctDNA. So ctDNA is also found in the blood and it's fragments of dead cancer cells. Uh, so we've all got lots of cells in our body, they will die at a certain point and be replaced with new ones. When they die, they break into millions of pieces, they go in the blood, for, circulate a little bit, and then half-life's about an hour and a bit, and then they get excreted. So we've all got this cell-free DNA in our blood at any, any time, uh, but if you've got cancer, you might have some cell-free bits from uh, cancer, and that's what we mean by C CTDNA, circulating tumour DNA. So the world has been analysing this and getting DNA information, and there are big companies worth billions of dollars who have clinical labs just analysing that. So we decided uh, to take a gamble because we thought that actually the ctDNA analysis might not be giving a full picture of what's really happening in the cancer because it's not alive, it's dead. So by definition, if it's dead, something killed it. It might have died of old age, uh, but quite possibly it's been killed by the immune system or it's been killed by the therapy. 
in which case it's not telling you what's happening in the future, it's telling you what has happened. So we wanted to see what happens with uh, living cancer uh, cells, the circulating tumour cells. So we've pioneered the ability to analyse both things from the same tube of blood. So we get a tube of blood, we remove the plasma, which is the bit where the ctDNA is. That's really easy, that's the liquid bit. So you just spin the blood, take off the plasma. That's why everyone's doing this stuff, because it's easy. But we can do the hard bit as well, which is we take the blood cells, put them into a saline liquid, put them through our parasitic system, and we can get out the circulating tumour cells. So we sequence the ctDNA in the same way the industry does. Then we sequence the CTC DNA in exactly the same way. So two analytes from the same tube of blood process in an identical way. Um, and the idea was, could we find anything in the living um, cancer cells which was not present in the dead? So if it's in, li in the living cells spreading the cancer, but not in the dead, then you know the immune system's not killed it. You also know that uh, the drug's not killed it. So this is what... This is the holy grail, really. Um, this is the evolution of the cancer that the doctor doesn't know about. So if we can find that, that was a gamble that we went out with. And we've, we've, what we announced was we successfully completed a 47-patient study, matched samples for all of them. And what we found is, actually, this hypothesis is correct. And 70% of breast cancer patients had actionable DNA variants, mutations, in their blood, which were not detectable by ctDNA and were not known about um, by, by, by the doctors, therefore. 70% in lung, 60% in ovarian, and 20% in prostate. So the answer is yes. If you can get the living cancer cells out and you do DNA information, you will get additional information beyond the ctDNA. So that opens up the potential for us to talk to all the ctDNA labs and say, guys, why don't you extend what you're doing to also look at living cells? All you need to do is adopt our system. You can run the same sequencing that you've already invested in, the same process, and get more information. <coughs> the other thing is that the industry has repeatedly said uh, that CTCs, you can't get them from many patients, and there's so few cells you can't do anything useful with them, etc. There's much more ctDNA available. Uh, that's also not true. Uh, so we found that in this patient cohort, 90% of the patients were positive for CTCs uh, in breast and in lung, and 70% in ovarian and prostate. Compare that with ctDNA, actually, it's a little bit better, not worse. Uh, so that, again, is a very important point in terms of the applicability of our technology. So examining the DNA variants that were present, we found actionable DNA variants. These are all well known to the field. Um, and they actually already have FDA-cleared drugs, which are cleared for, uh, for finding those actionable variants in tissue. So if a tissue biopsy comes in, these, these companies, Novartis, AstraZeneca, Menorini, um, Genentech, Puma, Beringer, the, these guys have already got multi-billion dollar drugs which are addressing these specific variants that we found in the blood. So they're now all targets for us because they could have more sales of their drugs if they did a blood test with Pasortix and found that was the, that PIX3CA was there or EGFR was there and did a clinical study to show that patients benefit from that, then uh, they could extend uh, what they're doing. So th we do think that this, the, the reason our stock price moved, uh, it should have moved more really, um, it is because of the importance of these actionable DNA variants that you find in CTCs that you don't find um, in ctDNA. So um, I'm going to wrap up now, and Ian, if you want to come out for questions, uh, is our CFO. But what I'd like to leave you with is a really important point, which is that in all these medical fields, it's not what I tell you as a company that's important. It's what the world tells you and what other third parties uh, have said. And in our case, we've got 41 independent cancer centres, nothing to do with Angle, uh, who have used our system. They've either bought it or we've um, provided loan equipment to them. They run their own studies and they've published 92 peer-reviewed uh, publications. Most of those are on our website, freely available. Uh, and it shows that our system works without modification in 24 different cancer types. Uh, so it's, it's very well proven, uh, and there's a lot of different things going on. So thank you very much for your attention. We, um, we know that a number of you are Angle shareholders and interested parties already, so we're happy to take detailed questions or also take uh, you know, general questions, whatever you prefer. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Okay, questions please. Again, wait for the microphone please before you ask a question. Everyone's a bit shy today. I'll start off. A question here please, Steve? Uh, um, um, thank you, Chris. Uh, that was a very fast flowing and very impressive presentation and uh, one can only hope, irrespective of uh, the business aspects to it, that the health benefits that uh, clearly you're able to develop are picked up by those who can actively take them to market and maybe extend my life slightly. <laughs> um, the, uh, looking at it from a businessman's, businessman's perspective, uh, I'd be interested in the comments of your uh, funding because if I just read very briefly, financial highlights, uh, revenues for the half year trebled to 1.2 million, which is great, trebling uh, something's always good. Oh, usually good, not cancer cells, presumably. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, you burnt through the thick end of £10 million during that uh, period of time, and that's not an entirely comfortable uh, position to read as a potential investor. That was planned investment. So investors, we raised money. Uh, we raised £20 million back in uh, sort of June 22. Uh, we're deploying the capital we raised on specific activities, do, uh, clinical studies, generating the data that will get to customers. We're not just spending it willy-nilly. This is actually planned expenditure. And the medical industry, uh, the nature of it is you have to generate data to convince people, particularly when you're doing a pioneering activity such as ourselves, and particularly where people you know, need to be convinced. And the way you do that is through data and through partnerships and collaborations. That costs money. You run a clinical study, it takes a number of years. We've got the only FDA cleared product, right? That takes a lot of money. Most of our competitors can't do that. So we're not, if you, if you want a, a traditional organisation, right, we're not a dividend, we're not a safe stock, you know, but we are pioneering, we are developing, and uh, we're deploying the capital that we raised. Now, in terms of what that means going forward, uh, we did give a trading update back out in uh, November, so revenues um, for the sort of full year, we're saying 2.2. So you know, yes, it's modest at this stage. Um, the money we've got will take us out to Q2 25. Um, we're aiming to be cash flow break even by the end of 25. So we do have a gap um, in terms of getting through to cash flow break even. Uh, we're seeking to fulfill that through either accelerating revenues further if we can, uh, getting in milestone payments or doing deals with large strategics or corporates to fill that through. But, um, you know, we're doing it on a shoestring compared to um, our American cousins. But the nature of the industry we're in, you have to deploy capital to get that leadership position. You know, we're the only company with the FDA clearance. We've got best-in-class results from our studies in a bearing, 95.4% air end of the curve. All those things cost money. They don't happen by not spending money. Uh, it's, the, it's what I should draw from that, uh, that if one invested, one would expect a rights issue somewhere in uh, early 25? Well, as I've just explained, we'll, we are seeking to accelerate uh, revenue growth or we're seeking to get milestone payments from strategic partners that would mean we um, don't have to do a capital raise. Now, historically, we have done capital raises every year because we've been burning more. We were much earlier in the process of our commercialisation. So, um, you know, that's part of being a listed company is that um, you know, you can raise capital. We, at the moment, are very tightly focusing our spend. So we're not doing all, you know, we're a platform technology, but we're only working in a finite number of uh, cancers. So we, we're not in a position, we don't need to raise money immediately. Uh, clearly, we will need some capital uh, to fill that gap, whether it's um, through other partners or from the markets. We'll just have to see when we get to that point. Okay, thank you very you. much, and I, I wish you every success in, uh, in the venture. Thank, thank you. you. Question here, please. Uh, you mentioned the NCCN guidelines on doing secondary biopsies in metastatic <laughs> breast cancer in the US. Yeah. Exactly, sort of what sort of percent of patients with secondary metastatic breast cancer actually do the biopsies, and um, what percentage of those are currently conducted by on CTCs? isolated by parsortics? Uh, so um, what I was talking about there was the um, current standard of care in the United States and the guidelines uh, require a biopsy if it's possible. In reality, just under 50% of patients will get a biopsy. The remainder, um, they're either too sick for the operation or they elect not to have it. Some of them say, well, I just don't want to go through another operation. 
um, or there's not enough uh, material available. So if it's a lung, lung biopsy, they can't get enough out, or if it's in the bones. Obviously, if it's in the brain, they won't access it because that's too dangerous. Um, and your question was, what percentage of them are getting a CTC uh, yes. biopsy? Zero. Oh, right. This is what we're working to try and achieve, uh, a, a groundswell change in uh, the way that medical um, science is, is operated. Do you, do you suppose that some of the people who do have um, a secondary biopsy might die as a result of the biopsy? Yeah, some of them do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and also, and also yeah. lots die yeah. from being given drugs that um, have side effects exactly. and are not going to benefit yeah. from them. Even more die from that. A question yeah. over here, please, and then we'll come back to you. Hello. Um, I mean, I can see there has been an incredibly long accumulation of data that should create enough visibility for the world, for companies to see the potential. Why is this not stabilizing the share price? Please, can you explain to me the correlation? Yeah. Because there must be something done and a response by the market. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but we don't control the uh, supply and demand in the, uh, in the stock market. Um, uh, there's been you know, massive, massive movements of capital away from growth stocks, uh, and that's pushed down. Uh, there's been redemptions from funds for 28 months in a row where people have taken their money out of investment funds. This is not an angle-specific thing. E every single medtech stock in the, pretty much in the world, and certainly in the UK, has, is heavily down. Um, but I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we, we, that's why we're doing these kind of meetings, is to get more interest, more understanding, because we're trying to do something new. And people don't know about it. So um, we, we, we can sit in an ivory tower and assume they know, but they don't. So we have to get out and spread that message. And is there an alternative to, <laughs> to get more money in terms of, <laughs> of not raising it, but doing a, an alternative way of funding that mitigates uh, this, this instability? Yeah, so if we go back to the slide I was showing, just on one customer, if I can get it to work, uh, this one here, Esai, so I'm slight, slightly standing in the light, but Esai have got um, 80 clinical trials with 60,000 patients. The base cost, the price that we quoted them is $4,600 for a tube of blood. We discounted that to $2,500 for the pilot. Um, and the patients need to have at least, uh, in the trials, need to have a minimum of three time points. So just, just this one company, the 60,000 patients, three time points at $4,600 each. So there is a huge opportunity for building revenue. Now, uh, it took us the best part of a year to close the negotiation with ESI, um, including six months waiting for their trial to start. But now we're in. Um, and and la last week I went to New York and I went to their headquarters and met their people and talked to them about, um, about this project and about other potential projects. And they, they understand it. So they want to see the data from the pilots. So we can't get ahead of ourselves. We've got to show them that we've got good data. But there's an, this is just literally one company. They're probably the 20th on the list of the top 20 companies. They're not, they're not the biggest. There's other big companies. And they can, they can benefit themselves financially and obviously we can too so my hope is that by working with these kinds of companies they will take us the whole way to the market for a companion diagnostic so they'll pay for us to get the extended FDA clearance they'll pay for all the marketing they'll probably be the customer that pays for it so if you're selling a drug for a hundred thousand would you pay um, for a blood test for a couple of thousand of course you would if you can get a hundred thousand from selling the drug so there are plenty of opportunities for us to actually even just do the companion diagnostic paid for by them. But we're a bit over time, but we're going to have one final question for the gentleman here. And then, yeah. and then we're um, done. Cancer cells come from different tissues in the body, and the size of the cancer cells is interesting in your filtering system. Presume that by and large cancer cells are bigger than the, the red and white blood corpuscles. Yes. So you have to calibrate your kit to trap specific types of cancer. I mean, is a lung cancer cell going to be some, yeah, yeah, that, you know, significantly bigger or uh, different shape, say, from a, you know, a breast cancer cell or a prostate cancer cell? Yeah, that, that's a great question. In reality, what we found is that the same um, equipment works fine for 24 different cancer types. Um, in, in, in addition to you rightly pointing out that the cancer cells are different between different types of cancer, uh, of cancer 
Uh, they're also different in terms of their stage of the life cycle. So they, um, uh, they, so they sort of start, start at a median size, get bigger, and then they break into two and you get uh, smaller. So you've got everything from relatively small to relatively large. Um, and the red blood cells are way smaller, so they're not really part of it. Uh, the white blood cells also have a continuum. So you get very big white cells, white blood cells, which will overlap with the small cancer cells. Yeah. And we actually collect some of those. Uh, so, so there's particular immune cells called macrophages and megakaryocytes, etc., which we may collect as well, which also provide really useful information. But the, the big difference is the cancer cells are uh, generally two to three times bigger, and they're also less compressible. So if you think of the overlap of a squash ball and a golf ball, the golf ball represents the cancer <coughs> cell. So if you're pushing through a, a gap, that golf ball won't go through, but the squash ball will. That's terrific. But, well, yeah, well, I was just going to add two things. We do, so um, you can alter the, the pressure. We have standardized protocols, but you can alter the pressure. Um, so you can go through faster or slower. If you, if you go through slightly slower, you can alter the capture rates. And we also have different critical gap sizes as well. Um, but generally what we found is because of that distribution, we're consistently reliably capturing cells. And the question is, <clears throat> so we may not capture 100%, but we typically capture 70 to 80%. But we're not too worried about those, uh, the outliers, because um, you'll see the mutations in the cells that you but do there catch. there might be a few other cells as well, like the large... White yeah, well, but, or, but, or but any other, any other yes, but well, that's because of the overlap but yeah. of the cell size. But um, the white cells are increasingly going to be seen to be producing useful information because of the body's immune response to them. So we think so you can analyze both. So you can analyze both. White, white yep, cells, so you can analyze the cancer, i.e., which is the cells direct, but also the body's response to that as well. well so, white cells would probably have some response to the. Yeah, they, they may well do it. That's breaking area. Do you want to... we, we, I'm afraid okay. we, 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 we are out of time. But it's a fascinating to to subject. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.